Peter, are you there? I am here. Hello, guys. <laughs> now, Peter, you're speaking to us from... Um, stand by. I'm going to share the screen and go to Google Earth. So you're coming from... Uh, where are you now located in the world? We are in British Columbia, coastal British Columbia, south coastal British Columbia, and right now we're in Victoria. Right. Can you see the screen? There you go. You right. see the red dot. We're right there in the city of Victoria. Oh, wow. What a beautiful territory. Is that deep water that you've got in front? Is this deep water in here? Uh, yeah, it's deep enough for um, uh, people to plan to um, have a lot of oil tankers going through it. So uh, that's okay. one of the many things that we're, we're trying to stop, you know? Yeah, right. And that's a, uh, what have you got, a million people there in Victoria? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm just going to zoom out to see where we are in the world. What an extraordinary coastline. Oh, yeah. It's, 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 it's really great. Okay. I'm in Brisbane, so let me just zoom to Brisbane. So for people that are not familiar with uh, geography, um, all around the planet, we're almost diametrically opposed to where you're located. So here, <laughs> we are, here we are in the south uh, east of um, uh, Australia, and I am located somewhere in here around there somewhere okay great thank you peter for the people that are unfamiliar with you can you tell me a little bit about your background um and what what it is that you do yeah i'm retired i'm a medically trained doctor and i've been working on uh, environmental issues for many decades my background is in environmental health assessment and uh, for protection policy development so i've been doing that a long time started off with air pollution and then went to uh, children's toxicology and a sort of uh, natural thing was uh, especially when i retired to just focus on the issue of all issues of all time which is of course global climate disruption so um uh, and i've been working on websites you know years ago my friends told me well peter you know you're gonna have to have a website so i played around with that and then my friends told me well you know you're gonna have to have some youtube so i played around with that okay. and and as you, as you're probably aware that's sort of the fun part of it i guess and uh, so i'm a published um uh, expert uh, expert reviewer for the intergovernmental panel on climate climate change and of course the last one was the 1.5C report, which was an excellent report. The scientists did a great job on that one. Okay, now can you give us a quick um, overview of the main findings of the 1.5C report? Yeah. Um, firstly, it was, um, it was rather a delayed result, I must say. Uh, I had always realized, and many of my colleagues around the world, that the two degrees C was uh, pretty crazy because it was a, a certain route to catastrophe. Um, uh, James Hansen, of course, who was always ahead of uh, most of the scientists on climate change, um, uh, he uh, published a couple of papers that said that two degrees C would be absolutely, totally disastrous. And so uh, we were greatly relieved when the IPCC uh, agreed to do a special report uh, called the 1.5 degree C report relating to uh, population, poverty, and sustainable development. And uh, that report finally, without any question, uh, proved that two degrees C was absolutely out of the question. Total right. catastrophe. Right. And, um, uh, and the 1.5 degrees C uh, was pretty bad. Um, uh, disastrous in fact, but we had to do everything we possibly could, as the IPCC said, that we had to uh, make profound changes in every aspect of our society to have a chance of uh, limiting to 1.5 degrees C or maybe going over and being able to come back uh, eventually to 1.5 degrees C. So that was very good. The, uh, the media picked up on that pretty well. Um, uh, we were just talking, a lot of the young people certainly picked up on that. The report actually made a very big difference. Um, since uh, James Hansen, um, uh, who I had the pleasure of meeting in New York a few months ago, um, since he um, made a public statement in 2008 that we were indeed a, in a state of planetary 
emergency due to climate change. Um, that's when I started my uh, online uh, climate emergency institute. Right. And got doing some a lot of consultations with the UN departments, you know, uh, UN climate secretary, and of course the uh, FAO with respect to uh, global agriculture, which is a huge, huge concern. Mm. So um, just to recap that, so what we've got is the, the Paris Climate Accord, which was um, signed in uh, what, uh, December 2015. December. Yeah, uh, in which most of the world's governments committed to um, this, this, this concept of that we can basically allow the planet to get two degrees hotter but no more than that, because otherwise we're in big trouble. Point five degrees hotter, no more than that. Uh, yeah. So the way the way that I the way that I kind of describe two degrees is like if you go down to the um, seaside where you've got the cliffs and you've got your children with you to go and play on the grass, you know, the grass in front of the cliffs. That if two degrees is actually the edge of the cliff, what you're basically allowing your children to do is to go and put their toes on the edge of the cliff, as opposed to saying two degrees is dangerous for humanity. We should have a guardrail be something like one degree or maximum. Is that it's a fair analogy? analogy? It's a good analogy, but all the time uh, we were working on the so-called two degree C target, we were pushing our children and future generations over the cliff. Yeah. Without, yeah. without any question. So business... 1.5 degree C is going to be really bad. And but where are we at? Where we're at one degree C now. Uh, we're at one now, is that the... Yeah. Is that, yeah, right. one, one. Although um, uh, um, one of the things that um, unfortunately um, I've been able to present on over recent years, probably the past four or five years, is absolutely everything um, a guy is accelerating. Yeah. All of the, uh, the, the problem of course is atmospheric greenhouse gas pollution. That, that's the problem from yeah. the environmental health point of view. And um, absolutely every indicator and every direct impact of atmospheric greenhouse gas pollution are not only still increasing, mm. they're increasing very fast mm. and they're accelerating. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, this is, um, this is really game over if we don't get our leaders, so-called, to wake up um, and do something because they do worse than nothing is what they do. Mm. They're continuing to subsidize the fossil fuel co corporations, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've just had a, an election in Australia, a general election, and we've got the, the, uh, the Conservative Party has been returned. Uh, right. and, uh, and the story goes that uh, there was a billionaire coal magnate um, who ran his own party and gave all of his preferences to the Liberal Party. And so he was instrumental in getting the Liberal Party in. Um, and one of the big, uh, the big stouches in all of this has been the proposal to open up this massive coal mine, which basically opens up an entire coal province called the Galilee. By, by, by Adani, right? The Adani mine, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so the so the way that that's so that basically it's not been green lighted officially, but the winning the, the conservative conservatives winning has taken away the major kind of mainstream political imperative to stop it. Um, and that's basically going to be something in the order of sixty million tons of thermal coal yeah. a year extracted um, tr train line which is, has to be built to the coast and then put it on a ship and drive it through what's left of the Great Barrier Reef. <laughs> these, are, these are all, these, um, all of these huge um, present um, fossil fuel extraction projects, and this of course is probably the worst in the world because it's coal for heaven's sake. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, they're criminally insane is what they are. Yes. I mean, there's no other way to describe them. Um, I, I co-authored a book uh, uh, just over a year ago um, uh, called, uh, on the criminal aspect of climate change called okay. uh, Unprecedented Crime, um, oh, uh, Climate go. Science Denial. So, th I mean, it's, it's just uh, words do not, can't come close to describing the terrible, terrible crime, right, of uh, digging up more coal to burn because um, uh, it's got it, we're burning up the planet already, for heaven's sake. Look, I um, I think part of part of yeah, that I like the expression unprecedented crime. I'm just trying to find that on the web so I can share the screen. Okay. So I'm a bit distracted. Um, what I like about the you know uh, there there we we this crisis is new to obviously new to our culture. And there are, we are scratching around trying to find words to describe some of the things that we are seeing. 
And so Alan gave us inconvenient truth, which is a clever little phrase, and it's yeah. still running true today. And unprecedented crime, I, I, uh, I resonate with that straight away. I found something here. Let me just, um, give me a second just to find this so we can promote it. Is that the one with the umbrellas? That's the one. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I found something here. So let's go and share the screen. Um, share. So um, I, I co-authored it with a, uh, with a lady who's an excellent um, English writer. There you go. What is this? Um, who actually lives in Victoria here. She's called Elizabeth Woodworth. Okay. So we co-authored the book. We were very fortunate in having James Hansen do a foreword for the book. Yep. And um, uh, um, it's a thoroughly referenced. It's an academic type book in the sense that it's got all the references, all the evidence. Um, but it's extremely well written as well because um, of Elizabeth Woodward's hand in the writing. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you. I'm glad I've uh, come across that. And I love your, um, I love your, <laughs> I love your, your diagram of all of the black umbrellas in the middle of it is the, the, the <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, 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 the publisher, the publisher is uh, Clarity Press in the United States, and yeah, that was a pretty good uh, book cover. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Okay. Let's come back off the share. Um, <clears throat> okay. So. Um, yeah, so, so the world's governments have all basically committed to suicide the planet. Um, yes. And, and are probably going to more than just suicide the planet, they're going to uh, doubly suicide the planet. And um, because they're not going to meet, because they're not looking like they're going to meet their Paris targets, which is... The yeah, it's global, it's global homicide and, and ecocide. Is what yeah. it is. I, um, I did an interview recently with um, Paul Ulrich, and he made a comment oh. um, that... Um, that um, he said that modern ethics is a footnote to Plato. And whereas modern technology is in no way a footnote to, you know, Newtonian motion and so forth. The idea being that we've, as a race, we have technologically advanced in great leaps and bounds. But when it comes to ethics um, and sort of the, the cultural sort of display of ethics, we, we really haven't actually progressed much in about the last 3000 years. And we've been, we've, been, we've been going backwards from the environmentalist point of view because, of course, the, the root cause of all this is the um, uh, perverse, irrational, insane economic system that we have, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and, of course, you know, the, uh, the Stern report back in 2006 was very good at bringing attention to that, you know, greatest ever market failure. Well, what that meant was that um, the fossil fuel corporations were avoiding paying the costs of environmental health pollution, which are, which are huge. Yeah. So although, of course, climate change um, uh, is a, um, it's an existential threat, right? I mean, we're looking at a threat to our survival, yeah. as the United Nations um, Secretary General Antonio Guterres said in, uh, exactly a year ago, actually, um, yeah. uh, at a um, world uh, summit the Austrian World Summit. He said, this is an existential threat. That's what it is. And it's a threat to the survival of most life on the planet and particularly humanity. Mm -hmm. You know, guy, that was hardly covered at all by the media. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, but he kept plugging away and making other um, statements from the United Nations head office. And, um, and he's great. You know, he's really, really good. I mean, he's telling it how he is. Mm -hmm. I guess there's him. And there's the 15-year-old Swedish teenager, Greta Thunberg, who are sort of telling it as it is. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, what, here's, a, here's another, here's a point. Um, the concept of the um, aerosol masking effect in the global dimming yes. suggests that if we were hypothetically to turn off the fossil fuel emissions overnight, that we would actually probably zoom straight past that two degrees in a relatively short space of time. Is that, have I got that? Yeah, actually, the, that's a very good question, Guy. Um, and, and, you know, that's sort of been brushed aside, um, uh, you know, by the scientists. Oh, you know, that's not going to be too big a deal. We can cope with that. But actually, it's huge. Um, uh, in the IPC 1.5C report, um, they estimated that the, um, you have to stop burning fossil fuels, right? 
to yeah. stop climate disruption, ocean acidification, and the planet going down. So um, uh, inevitably, we have a commitment, which is what the scientists call it, to an extra warming when we stop the fossil fuels, stop the aerosol cooling. So that's air pollution. Yep. And uh, IPCC 1.5 got that at 0.5 degrees C. So that's a lot. The yeah. AR5, the fifth assessment in 2014, put it as high as C. There's just been a paper published, actually, just a week ago. Um, uh, I think it's a university, as I recall, in Germany. And they did a completely different um, uh, way of estimating what taking, you know, they call it unmasking the, the, the warming, as you know. And, and this paper said that uh, we've been underestimating it greatly, um, that it's probably double what those estimates have been. But the other thing that the IPCC 1.5 pointed out was, this isn't just a pulse of a, you know, a few months or a year or two. It's gonna go on a long, long time. Right. So it's a, it's, a, it's a huge commitment. What we've been doing, guys, is we've been deferring to uh, future generations, right? We've been deferring so much of the impacts of, that we know that are in the science. Hey, they've been in the science since 1990, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's really incredible. Yeah. So um, that is just one of many. There's all the heat that's gone into the ocean. So there's ocean heat lag. We've deferred that to future generations. When I say we, uh, I mean our governments. Uh, that's really who I'm referring to. And of course, yeah. the corporations, right. yeah. banks who yeah. are financing all these horrible projects. Yep. Like the Adani coal mine. Yep. And um, uh, we, um, uh, this is really why it, it is an unfathomable, horrendous, horrendous crime. Because um, now I think, well, the, 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 let's face it, the young people have woken us up, you know. Mm. Um, uh, and we are in a hell of a mess, as you know. So, um, so the heat lag is this idea that if you, uh, so that my understanding is that if, that the warming that we are seeing today is a result of the emissions that came out of the, you know, society 20, 30 years ago. Is that right? There's, there's this idea. It, it changed, changed a little bit, Guy. It, 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 you're, it always used to be for decades, it was about 30 years. Um, two years ago, um, uh, um, there was a second look at this and um, uh, it comes down to actually a lot less. It comes down to about, to about 10 years. Right. Um, but that means, what that means is because our emissions are going up every year, okay, what that means is that today, or at any time today, the most of the heat that we're piling up in the lower atmosphere is to come, right? Yeah. So it's going to come in 10 or 15 years. And, you know, we haven't got this across to the public very well at all. We really haven't. Um, uh, commitment, as the scientists call it, um, it's referred to as lock-in, which is good. Lock-in, you know? yeah. yeah. So we've got more warming locked in than we're experiencing today. And it's a lot more warming because, as you say, it's, it's a commitment to the aerosol cooling that's going to disappear. Yeah. The ocean heat lag, 95% of the heat has gone into the oceans, right? Yeah. Yeah. But the big thing of the ocean heat lag is how long this is going to last. Mm. So the, the scientific models now say, if we stopped all emissions instantly, right? Yeah. Then it wouldn't make a scrap of difference, really. The, the, the yeah. warming that we've got, the climate disruption that we've got, would just go on and on. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, so that really tells us how, how huge it is. But yeah. that does not include the aerosol that you brought up originally. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't include that. So I, I see your, your name periodically on my news feed because I'm part of a healthy climate alliance uh, news group. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, one of the, and their model is um, basically a climate restoration, which is a drive to get atmospheric CO2 back down to 300 parts per million by 2050 and to pull a thousand billion tons of carbon out of the air through drawdown practices. Um, and I've actually recently been uh, having a chat with um, uh, Brian von Herzen from the uh, Climate Foundation, whose project is called marine permaculture talking to him about um how you can actually basically use this technology called upwelling pumps where you bring the water from the depth in the ocean to bring nutrient to the sunlit surface 
to kick off a, a, a plankton bloom, basically. Um, and so, and my sort of reading is that, and this, so this becomes doubly valuable, well, triply, well, because um, if you can kick off this plankton bloom, you can grow all sorts of fish, which is able to feed people as well as improving the biodiversity. But the plankton actually help to produce um, cloud nucleating agents to help produce marine clouds, which can actually help to reduce the incoming radiation. Um, and potentially also, um, and that could maybe be a, a way of countering the um, aerosol masking effect that is lost when you turn off the fossil fuel generators. Mm -hmm. So somehow there could be a way of kind of balancing the spread of this marine permaculture technology at the same time as we pull down on the coal-fired emissions in order to sort of balance out so that we don't end up with that big spike in temperatures that comes from removing the global dimming effect. Yeah, we, we've always had to remove um, some carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Yeah. That goes back to 1995. And the reason for that is that because carbon dioxide sort of lasts forever, the IPC says to remove all the carbon dioxide that we've emitted into the atmosphere will take hundreds of thousands of years. Hundreds yeah. of thousands of years. So um, uh, um, some of the scientists um, some years ago uh, uh, made a point by saying CO2 lasts forever. So it practically lasts forever, right? Yeah. So that means that to stop ocean heating, surface warming, surface heat, ocean acidification, our emissions have to be actually stopped. Yeah. They have to come down to zero. Now we can't obviously do zero. We're still gonna be doing agriculture and some other things, you know, which inevitably is gonna release some CO2. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we're, you know, we're, I mean, we're putting 37 um, uh, gigatons into the atmosphere every year now, so that's absolutely crazy. But the fact remains, we have to get down to zero. And we can't get down to zero without re having a capacity to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So what should be happening is that our governments should be making a huge investment, right? And, and this, I mean, this should have started years ago. We should have a, um, uh, what I would call a Manhattan Apollo yeah. um, Marshall project, a huge project, unlimited funding, right? In order to rescue the future, in order to literally save ourselves and the rest of life on this wonderful planet. Yeah. So that, uh, and, and that would mean, just like the um, Manhattan Project, that would mean looking at all the possibilities, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, uh, but, you know, I, I mean, they, there's a lot of great ideas, you know, been hanging around for a long time. Mm. But governments aren't interested. And the economy will not allow it mm. because the economy is so, call it perverse, you know, yeah. I mean, it's a crazy, it's a crazy economy, basically. Well, you mentioned the, the fossil fuel subsidies in the order of $5 yeah. trillion dollars a year. Well, that, that, you know, the International Monetary Fund of all agencies in 2015, they did a fresh assessment of fossil fuel subsidies. And they came out with just over $5 trillion a year, which was a huge shock to everybody. Um, uh, but what they did was very proper. They treated these externalities, which, I was, which are avoided costs. They're avoided real costs, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, about 3 million people a year are being killed from fossil fuel air pollution, for example. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these are huge costs. And they're happening every year, year after year after year, and they're getting, uh, the costs are going up year after year. So they got it to just over $5 trillion a year. Mm. Now, they settled down a little bit, but over the past couple of years, they're increasing again. So the IMF just published uh, another report, and it's even higher. So it's right. five point something or other, which is even higher than it was in 2015. Right. And well, that, is a, that is a criminal um, action of um, unfathomable evil. Well, basically, because you know, we know we know what this is going to do. It's destroying the planet. We know that. So I think Australia is about to make its contribution soon with maybe another billion for the Adani mine. That's <laughs> not written in stone, but that's in the pipeline. Um, unbelievable! You, unbelievable! Yeah. yeah, and you mentioned criminality, and um, and I think this is coming back to that Paul Ulrich comment about the 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 ethics is a modern ethics is a footnote to Plato, is that we don't have. Uh, I don't think we've got a proper language to describe how unethical it is 
to do that. I mean, we can say it's unethical, but we're lacking uh, <laughs> yeah. we're lacking some sort of like academic discipline as to how you then flesh out that statement. Um, I mean, what I would say, guys, is this: if this isn't evil, right, then what the hell is, right? Well, that's you know, yeah. we know we have overwhelming evidence, right? We're killing everything, right? Yeah, you know, um, look at look at the Great Barrier Reef for heaven's sake. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, I really believed, I totally believed when I started sort of getting into a um, bit of an activist aspect on the science. I totally believed. I, I knew that the Barrier Reef would not l last under 1.5 C. I knew that the science was out there. Yeah. I figured that when the Barrier Reef was was being killed, basically. Mm -hmm you know, by surface warming and ocean acidification, that everybody would wake up and say, and then, but no, it didn't happen. And it didn't happen because we have the worst, they're not leaders, right? I mean, how can you call people leaders? You know, the big CEOs of the banks and the CEOs of the energy corporations and, and all of our politicians, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, they're really destroying the future is what they're doing. I've been watching the Australian election and a big part of it was focused on North Queensland because the, the Adani mine was a, um, was a, was a key part of this um, whole debate. And oh, it was it? The, the Adani wow. mine was a very big part of this, this recent election. Um, wow. I mean, in part because the, everyone who had a green sentiment was vehemently against it. Um, the Labor Party wasn't able to actually say whether it was for it or against it. So it sat on the fence and tried not to talk about it. And the, um, the coalition government was um, very much for it. Um, and um, so I actually lived in Townsville for 11 years. And Townsville is one of the towns yes, yeah, that yeah, yeah. benefit potentially from uh, the mining activities. Because it's not just the Adani mine, it's a whole province. And uh, next to the Adani mine is a, a mine or a potential mine that's land that's owned by Clive Palmer, who's the guy from the, the politician that, that spent $60 million on advertising and directed all of his preferences to yeah. the coalition, who they probably consented that if they get in, they'll let him have his mine. And there's actually about five or six mines in this entire province. And once the infrastructure goes in for Adani, then, then everyone else can piggyback on the back of the infrastructure. Um, and look, it, and look it's, a, it's an economically depressed region and it suffers um, what the economists refer to as the Dutch disease in a way, uh, which is this concept that when, a, when an economy is focused so solely on one um, activity yeah. and, and, with, yeah. with, and it was like oil, I think it was oil industry in the Dutch as the example, was that every other part of the economy suffers. And so what happens is it becomes really black and white for the people living in that region that we're either going to have bit monster coal mines or we're all going to go bankrupt and have to go and move to the city or something. And that's the way, and that's, that was the sort of polarity of the debate. And so, um, um, uh, you know, so Bob Brown, who's our hero politician from the Greens Party that led the, the plan, the yes. actions yes. to prevent the Franklin Dam being uh, dammed, uh, the Franklin River being dammed back in the 70s, he came up yeah. with a big tour of people. And, um, and it turned out to be a very... A, politically polemic thing to do because he's going into the territory this vast huge thousands of square kilometers of people that want to have nothing but coal mines because that's the only thing they know um and and of course these are the people who live on the shores of the great barrier reef and so one of the uh one of the people that managed to get through into the media was a cairns based reef tourism operator who was decrying the fact that the reef was dying and that was killing off this massive job creating um, enterprise, which is Great Barrier Reef Tourism, which I've personally worked in years ago. So it's like it doesn't seem like anything is going to stop this juggernaut. It doesn't seem like killing off the, the Great Barrier Reef, World Heritage Area, 68,000 jobs. That, that, that's that's roadkill for... Yeah, you, you, you know, you're right, Guy, about the ethic. You're right that we just don't have the ethic, but it's an earth ethic that yeah. we don't have. And, and, and um, uh, you know, some of the religious and faith groups over the past several decades have made a lot of progress on this, you know. Mm. Uh, creation care, you know, the encyclical by, uh, you know, um, uh, the, Pope, the, yeah. the Pope in 2015, and his declaration after 2015 that uh, 
uh, that changing the climate is a sin against God, you know. Um, but we've lost that, you know. Yeah. We, we, our culture's just lost it. Yeah. Well, but I, it doesn't make any sense economically. That, that's the other thing, right? Because um, uh, I recall, I think it was 1998, um, a Scientific American came out and it was a really good issue. Um, it covered particularly coal, actually, yeah. I remember. And it was saying, the planet at the crossroads, it was called. We are at the crossroads. Are we going to choose the best of all possible futures or the worst of all possible futures? Okay. Yeah. And of course, it's quite obvious with, with the brilliant, you know, science and technology and development of the renewable energy, you know, which is absolutely amazing. That's astoundingly good. You know, I mean, it's just awesome. Right. So we know that we can, we can have this future, right? Even the, the IPCC did a special report on renewable energy in 2012, I think. And they said at that time, there's more than enough renewable energy to replace all the fossil fuel energy. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Now, 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 you know, that means um, uh, virtually unlimited energy. That's the one. Thanks, Guy. <laughs> my <laughs> God, my memory still works. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, no, I found it. It, okay. was a, it was a very good issue, actually. And um, uh, here we are, you know, um, uh, we've known there's been lots of studies done. There's been lots of um, uh, articles like that one, you know, on how all the fossil fuel energy in the United States, for example, can be totally replaced by solar wind and other renewable energies. You know, I mean, we've known it for years and years and years. Um, uh, uh, my wife calls, calls it a failure of imagination and, and um, uh, Julie Johnston, the uh, She's an expert in sustainability, so she should know. Um, uh, but it is. It's a total failure of imagination because we are, we are um, we're losing. We are the yeah. biggest losers anybody could ever imagine because this future, as I say, unlimited, clean, safe, the more we use, the better it gets, the cheaper it gets, right? But, of course, we've got these terrible people mm. controlling the economy. Right. Mm -hmm. And we all know, right, that the, 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 the so-called premiers and prime ministers are just puppets, puppets mm -hmm. for the money. Right. Um, yeah. uh, but it's the wrong kind of money, for heaven's sake. Yeah. And look, I, the way I see it is that in a way, corporates, uh, I mean, if you compare the, the evil behavior of corporates versus the evil behavior yeah. of governments, in a way, corporates are kind of doing their job in a way because their, their mandate, their, their, what they're actually legally committed to do is to maximize shareholder value to beggar every other living human being and living thing on the planet in order to look after that small subset of humanity called the shareholders so they're kind of doing their job by being evil you know their yeah, job but you know what you know what you know what um uh, um i i think they could have made that excuse some years ago but apparently they can't anymore um uh, um uh, I must admit, rather cautiously, I've been transferring my not great amount of savings um, uh, from, you know, anything that goes, which is what most people have. And I've got it all now in renewable energy. You know, it's doing very well. Yes. It's done yes. very well. Thank you very much, right? Yes. Yep. Um, uh, and uh, there's all kinds of exciting new developments that come through, right, mm. in which people can actually make a very good profit. Now, mm. here's the whole thing, you know? Fracking for oil is actually not making a huge amount of money. Yes, it's a great liability, I hear. It's crazy. Yeah. It's absolutely crazy. Yeah. So there's a few people in the know, right, who can put some money into it and sort of they'll make a killing. Yeah. But no, no, no. It's, um, uh, um, so it not only makes zero sense, zero sense for the future, because we'll have zero future. Mm. It makes no sense. Even on this market economics, for heaven's sake. Yeah, yeah. And look, that's you know, a good point. That's it's, good wrong, point. it's wrong, wrong, wrong. The, on one hand, we've got the, the, the continued expansion of the fossil fuel industry. And on the other hand, we've got all these great investment opportunities in renewables. Yeah. And this, yeah. So this, is, what I, this is what I call, um, I, like, I like to invent names if nobody's invented them. So I call this um, colansition or like it's a portmanteau of collapse and transition because the collapse of the global ecosystem is continuing unabated at yes. the same time as the transition to the clean tech economy or the clean sustainable economy continues unabated. So on one hand, yeah. we've got Clive Palmer's going to get his stupid coal mine. 
And on the other hand, we've got the children waking up and telling yeah. adults to wake up. And so the you big see, question is how those you, two you, things play out. You're, 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 you're right. And um, of course, you know, I suppose you and I and many other people assume that if renewable energy did take off, and my God, it's taken off, you know, um, uh, that it would, you know, the governments and corporations and the banks who finance all these, you know, huge enemy uh, projects would, you know, have the decency, you know, the good sense to make the money in a good way. Yeah. Because they have. So, so we have this, like you say, we have this insane situation in which renewable energy is increasing actually exponentially, you know, it's growing all the time, right? But, but the fossil fuel energy is growing almost as fast as it always has. Mm. So we've got still, so we're still looking at 80% of world energy being provided by fossil fuel energy. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And um, uh, all we would have to do, you know, if, if, if we could force the government to pull these subsidies, right? Mm. He, for heaven's sake, some, some, a coal, coal industry in some regions is already competitive with, with wind, et cetera, because oh. we hear that some, um, uh, some regions have made the decision against coal, right? It's, it's, so it's totally competitive. Yeah, look, so I got to believe that it's only being supported by these damn subsidies. Yeah, look, some of the cheapest, I think the cheapest energy in Australia is new solar with, with storage. Um, oh, oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. you mean concentrated solar? No, no, uh, PV with batteries. PV. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, we've got, I mean, what's going on in Australia, besides, besides this crazy coal mine going on, uh, we've got these vast, huge solar farms going up all over Australia. I mean, Australia is vast and sun-drenched. You know, yeah, yeah, you've got a lot of sun, right? Yeah. yeah. And um, we've got, like, a relatively good transmission network. We've actually got to the point now where... There is so much new solar coming into the network that there's all these bottlenecks and there with some people scratching oh, really? technically figuring out how to get like pieces of infrastructure yeah. in place. That's a nice problem, isn't it? It's a great problem to have, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I and I can see in a way how a, a government like a coalition government that like so and I and I and I don't mean to be to point the finger at people for their religious beliefs, but he's a born again he's a Pentecostalist, he's a born again Christian. And and, and, and what that means, I think, is that you, you, you're, you're less connected to science and rationality and reason and basic humanitarian values because you're thinking about God all the time. And also, I, went, I, read, I read about his, the beliefs of his particular church. So he believes that, when you, uh, that you should get saved in order to not go to hell because we're born into sin, that the Holy Spirit comes into you which gives you gifts such as being able to speak in tongues, and he believes that Jesus oh. Christ is coming back. So I don't know if that's a good package of beliefs that, that really well, it, sets you up well to deal with the climate crisis. I don't it's know. Certainly, it's, certainly, guy, it's certainly not the, um, I mean, I was brought up a Christian, right? For heaven's sake. Um, uh, you know, in lovely countryside in England. Like this, though, I, don't I guess I'm Christianity um, immersed in a sense, right? But. Yeah. I know for a fact that, that that wasn't anything like the religion of Jesus and the early Christians, right? The early Christians were total pacifists, right? Yeah. We know that. Yeah, and they ran against authority. Yeah, that's right. They were rebels. They were rebels. They were, um, uh, before my father went to fight in the Second World War, he was going to go into the ministry. And, and um, uh, my mother, after my father passed away, <laughs> told me, you know what your, your father thought about Jesus? I said, no, I never asked him. She said, he, your father believed he was a rebel, social rebel. And I guess maybe that's what the Jewish people classify him as, a great rebel, right? You know, but we sure need rebels now. We've got Extinction Rebellion on the go. Well, I, I'm actually, I'm a rebel myself. I am not, I haven't signed up to any Extinction Rebellion group, but I am nonetheless planning Extinction Rebellion type activities. And in right fact, on. I did an interview with Roger Hallam the other day, who's the founder of the Oh, yeah. Yep, I spent 15 minutes with him. And, um, and uh, I told him, this is just before the election, I said, look, it's looking like Labor might get in. This is what we thought before the election. And, uh, and their climate policies apparently are 56% of what we need. So I, I said sort of a little bit smugly, I said, so we, if they get in, we might have to give them a little Extinction Rebellion tickle. And he kind of scolded me. He says, he says it's not about tickling. He said, time to get serious. He said, if they get in, the next thing you need to do is shut down the capital cities and force their hand. And I'm like, I get it. I get it. I get it. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, they, they've got to be right because, as I say, the future is being totally destroyed. Um, yeah. I, I spend time on my on my website that you asked me about. Um, oh, let me go to that now. Um, Stateofourclimate.com. Yeah. I, what I do is I um, I keep a record every month, okay, uh, of all the essential data, and I track oh, the data trends. And this is what I present at the uh, big science conferences. So let me run through with you okay. a, few, a few of the current data, Guy. Okay. I've got, I've got it up on the one, here. The most important one is, is atmospheric carbon dioxide, right? Atmospheric carbon dioxide in the first quarter of this year is increasing faster than it ever has. And when I say ever has, I mean in the past 40 million years. Okay, where's that? I'm looking at the um, website now. Have you got a graph here somewhere? You have to go on to the CO2 page, which is a sub page of atmospheric greenhouse gases. Yeah. There you go. Okay, good. So hopefully it's there. Yep, okay. Okay, there you go. So um, there you see atmospheric carbon dioxide uh, accelerating, constantly accelerating. And on the right side, under the red there, Okay, you'll see what I'm talking about. When we started into climate change measuring uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide, you know, at Mauna Loa site in Hawaii, mm -hmm. um, it was increasing at about one part per million per year. Right. Currently, currently it's increasing faster than it ever is that, has. So, so that's the so first quarter. Is that saying, is that, saying that, that CO2 has gone up three parts per million in April? Yeah, uh, compared to the last April, it's gone up three parts per million. Uh, the last decade, it was going up two parts per million. The decade before that, it was going up 1.5 parts per million. Okay, so April to April is three yeah. parts per million. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it that hasn't gives, gone up. That gives us, that, that gives us the rate at which we're on. Um, uh, now, right. you consider that, and in 2017, the World Meteorological Organization, who I must say they're really excellent on climate. The WMO issued an annual greenhouse gas bulletin in which they said the abrupt rise, their word, of atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration over the past several decades has never been seen before. So um, uh, we, got the, we can take the records back 40 million years now. And so it's going up way faster. Um, it's going up, it was going up last year at the rate a uh, hundred times faster, a hundred times faster than the natural carbon dioxide concentration. It's 400, that's out of date already now. It's 411 parts per million already. Right. But you can see, you can see that little, that little uh, kick up at the top there, guy. Yeah. That's yeah. Three parts per million, right? Yeah. Um, it happened in 2015-16 when we had a very big El Nino. But it's happened again this year, and we've just got a weak El Nino. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, people, um, you know, I guess graphs and numbers, I, I mean, they probably send people to sleep. But we do need to try and get across to people just how bad, how terrible this is. Yeah. You know. Speak to, uh, speak to this one. So this shows the CO2 over the last 10,000 yeah. years. And that really that's very important because that's over the last 10,000 years. That's what we call the Holocene. 10,000 years is pretty vital to us because that's the agricultural era, right? Yeah. Okay. So we know that agriculture works very well within Holocene limits. Um, we're now way above Holocene limits, way, way, way above, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, 411 parts per million. The maximum over the Holocene is about 280 parts per million, which right. is approximately pre-industrial, right? Yeah. Now, yeah. if you go back even further, we can go back with the ice cores. We can go back 800,000 years. Actually, we've got a couple that go back a million years now. Um, uh, that one there, right? Yeah. Thanks, Guy. This is really helpful, I must say. <laughs> right. right. So here we have 800 million years of atmospheric carbon dioxide. 800,000 years. 800,000 years. It's never, ever gone above 300 parts per million. Yeah, okay. And now it's 411 parts yeah. per million. That, yeah. That, yeah. yeah. That's way, 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 way above. Yeah. Okay, so, so for the uninitiated, why are we 
fussing out over CO2 and not methane or nitrous oxide or chlorofluorocarbon 65 or something? We should, be, uh, we should be fussing over them all because they're all in their own way devastatingly dangerous, right? Mm. CO2, as I said, lasts forever, right? Mm. Um, uh, but of course, CO2, we must remember, is causing acceleration, accelerating ocean acidification. Yeah. I just checked, I don't have this down yet, unfortunately, but I just checked the, the Japan Meteorological Agency is the best source for ocean acidification. It's okay. accelerating like, like crazy over the just the past few years. Um, so, um, uh, and I don't have that up on the, um, I only just got that today. I don't have that on the website. We, d we, we got some media attention because the daily um, atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration um, last week uh, hit a record, of course, of over 415 parts per million. So these are, these are insane numbers. These are literally end of our world numbers. We're not, we can't live with these numbers. Yeah. So we, our colleagues who are working uh, and, uh, with the idea, right, of how to start extracting carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, um, that's a survival imperative now. Yeah. So somehow we've known for years that we have to stop carbon dioxide emissions. We've known that for forever, right? Um, since we started in that. Yeah, that's from, uh, that's from the European Environmental Agency. So that's pretty bad. Now that's pH. Right. And acidification is the inverse of pH. So if you mirror image that, yeah. you'll see yeah. it shooting up, right? Yeah, okay. right. It's going up very, very quick, very, very fast. Yeah. And now, now it's clearly, clearly accelerating, which the World Meteorological Organization did warn us about in 2016. Mm -hmm. They did a great report on ocean acidification and they said it's accelerating, which it is. So as I say, this is completely criminally insane. Yeah. All of these adverse damaging to the entire planet, right? I think that we can measure. Yeah, that, that, that's one I sort of put together to try and put it encapsulated for people, right? So uh, global surface warming is accelerating, by the way. Mm. Um, uh, the uh, first quarter of 2009, the uh, NASA GISS on global warming, because they do the best global warming monitoring, um, is a warming of 1.32 degrees C. And we're trying to avoid going over 1.5. The land warming in the first quarter of 2019 was 1.68 degrees C. Wow. These are, we are looking at, at unsurvivable data now. And the trends, the data trends are definitely unsurvivable. There's no question about that. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Uh, That's the, you say the one. Japanese. Do you see the, you see the graph? Do you see the colored graph there? That's oh, the yeah. Japan Meteorological yeah. Agency. Okay, that one. Yeah. So I got one just today. Um, uh, and, um, oh, you can see it from there. See that top one? Right, okay. See, the red? see how it's accelerating downwards. Yeah, right. right. And they all are. They're all accelerating downwards. That means that acidification is accelerating up. Yeah. I, uh, I read an article recently that was called um, Drowning Doesn't Look Like Drowning. And it was basically saying that when people drown, quite often they're, they're close to people, their friends or family, who don't know that they're drowning because we are trained to, by you yeah. know, movies, to think that when you drown, you shout and wave your hands. Yeah. But when you're drowning, yeah. you're kind of like, you actually look quite passive. You look like you're treading water. And so, and so our culture, apart from not knowing who the sages are to talk to, um, we don't know what the extinction of our planet looks like. And that picture in front of us right now is what extinction of the human race and most of the species on the planet looks like. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's like, I, I mean, it, you know, it's a natural to me because I'm a medically trained doctor, right? So um, uh, one of the things we've lost is the ancient concept, which we know now is completely accurate, the ancient concept that the earth is a living organism, right? right. We, we lost that with, the, um, uh, with our um, uh, um, uh, uh, 
um, industrial revolution, basically, and the scientific revolution before. We completely lost that. We tossed it out of the window, right? The native people, indigenous people, never lost it. Yeah. So I don't know how it is in Australia, but, but it's wonderful and amazing that here in Canada, um, uh, First Nations people, they're always out with their front lines, you know, saying no more pipelines, no more tankers, no more fossil fuels, right? So, I, I, you know, I, uh, the older I get, the more admiration I have for those people. Yeah, yeah. So it, the point I'm trying to make is that if, if we uh, took somebody who was sick, who had kidney failure and, let's say, liver failure, we'd measure, you know, these, um, uh, the results, these biochemical um, uh, that get lodged going around the circulation, increasing and damaging everything, and eventually would kill the patient, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That's what we're looking at here. We're looking at the same thing for the planet. Yeah. These are the medical records for the entire planet Earth. Yeah, yeah. Mother Earth, as, the, um, uh, as our indigenous people call them, and you're probably the same, because that seems to be a common realization, you know, amongst the indigenous people, which is still extinct, it's still present. They still have it. That yeah. the Earth yeah. is a living being, our mother, and, and the Earth is indeed sacred. So yeah. that we've lost, even though our religions guy have caught up over my lifetime and they all now say earth is sacred. We, we, we just don't have that. Like you say, I don't know what you do about that because you I mean, you're right. That's what the problem is at the very core, right? So I want to, I want to introduce an idea to you, Peter. So I've, I've yeah. thought this through. So part of, if we, if we want the Western people to regain the concept that the earth is a living system, a living, like alive. Yeah. Then, then hypothetically, if the, if the, if the, if the earth, if all the living things on the planet are part of a single living organism, which means that you yeah. and I are cells in a body, then what is the taxonomic classification of that species? What is the name of the living organism? So I put oh, the entire living organism. Yeah, so I put my name to that, and I've written this article uh, with a mate of mine, oh, um, Andrew okay. uh, The Empire of Life Needs a pop Proper Name. And what I've done is I've gone through the thought process of yeah. how do you name, if, 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 if Earth has got a living organism on it, then what's the species name? And what it's I've come up have with is going through this, this argument, I've given yeah. it the name Imperium Vitae Planeta. Which so that's his binomial. Yeah, 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 yeah. It literally translates to the empire of the living planet. Uh, I think that's great. Yeah, I okay. think that's brilliant. Now, what I've also done with that is I've taken that that name, Imperium. Oh, I see. Yes. And I've and I've reduced it down to Perium, and Perium is a religion devoted to the living planet, and a religion, wow. and a religion is a belief in a supernatural. Yes. And the behaviours that give effect to that belief. And so as I've been thinking this through over the last two years, and this was actually prompted by um, the Pope's encyclical, because I found that, uh -huh. that the encyclical is a great thing, but it's not the core business of the Catholic Church, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. They well, haven't divested it yet, guys. No, they haven't. No, they haven't. So, and so, so I've been sort of thinking, well, let's take the bones of religion. And I got advice from that from the Australian Taxation Office who say that a, a religion is a belief in a supernatural and the canons of conduct. So I'm thinking, okay, okay well, let's define what the supernatural is, which is Imperium yeah. Vitae Planeta, okay? Yeah. Because that's actually a belief because it's not scientifically validated right. with all the living right. things. And then, so then, I've, I de then I've sort of um, thought through a whole bunch of different practices. And so at all times live with earthity, oh. basically be good neighbors to the planet. Yeah. Um, Daily, give thanks. So say thanks, Plankton, yes. right? Um, yes. every, every week, practice your Peria mission, which is your specific mission that you've given yourself. <laughs> you. yeah. Mission yeah. for Imperium. Um, yeah. On a monthly basis, celebrate the moon, either the new or right. the full moon. Right. Get you in sync with natural cycles. Right. Um, on an annual basis, celebrate a new year that actually makes sense. So I've got a new yeah. year celebration called Earth New Year which is on the 16th of July, which is a commemoration of the um, Trinity bomb test, which I use oh. at the beginning of the Anthropocene. So that's coming oh, okay. up soon. On a decadal basis, visit a uh, place where you can see the night stars and, right. another, and another time go and visit a volcano because what you can then do is you can see what lies above and below Imperium Vida Planeta. 
Right. Um, yeah. And then once in a lifetime, go and visit the Uppington White Horse. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Well, you know, um, uh, we got a lot of those sacred sites in Europe, of course, you know. Yeah. Um, hey, that's brilliant, Guy. I love that. Yeah, and the, and the golden really rule. Cool. Treat that's, people. that's a brilliant idea, concept, and mission you came up with that. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's been finessed over a few years. I've got lots of advice. And, and actually, okay. tomorrow, I'm really excited because I'm doing an interview on this channel with Bron Taylor, who is a professor of religion um, with a speciality in um, earth-based religion. So I'm going to talk to him and then take uh, finesse this further from that conversation. But the well, that's, a good way to, that's a good way to go because, like I said earlier, it is out there, you know. Um, yeah. uh, um, this, the well, when I, when I went looking for a proper earth-based religion based on contemporary sustainability principles, there simply yeah. wasn't one. There was lots of stuff that was yeah. quite a bit like it. So I just sort of built it. So treat people and the planet how you want to be treated yourself. That's what the yeah. Bible is missing. That's yeah, that's they, exactly right. Our problem, that's our problem. Everything is about human beings. Yeah. Right? That is our problem. Hmm? Yeah. Um, and and our life is not about human beings. Our, our life is about, like you say, the whole living being. That's what it's about, right? Yeah. And, 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 and um, Einstein, Einstein made the great statement, didn't he? You know, that we, we see ourselves as just, you know, bounded um, by our skin and our own bodies, right? We don't see ourselves any further. So we're in a kind of prison, he said. And he said, what we have to do is what you're doing, which is expand our circle of consciousness to all living beings, planet Earth and the universe. Yeah. And that's what she looked. So this is, the, this is a contemporary photograph of Imperium Vitae Planeta. Um, okay. This is two days old. So this is from the Al Gore satellite, the uh, Discover satellite, which is parked out at L1, which is uh -huh. taking a constant stream of video and they put up, they put up new images every day. So oh. this is what she looks like. And what I found fascinating looking at these pictures is just um, is how much, how much desert like look at I mean that look at that vast stretch of largely lifeless territory. I mean there's obviously yeah. life there, but it's not abundant and rich. And then, and we're just losing the green stuff, you know. Oh yes, we are. Well, well, we are and we aren't, of course, because it's true that the forests have greened up quite a lot. The excess CO2. It's yeah. also true that the forests are failing. The, um, uh, the um, IPCC fifth assessment in 2014, and here's another scientific fact which just hasn't gotten out there. There's so many of them, I'm afraid. Um, they said that uh, the forests, quote, there's increased tree mortality, more trees are dying. There's increased forest dieback, so that's entire huge sections which are disappearing on all vegetated continents. Mm -hmm. So our CO2 has greened up our forests. Mm. But the, um, as they say, the IPC said it was due to increased temperature and drought stress. So at the same time, we are, we're taking the rug from, we're taking the ground from beneath the forest, basically. Yeah, yeah. So now um, uh, they're, they're failing. And what we're seeing, of course, and this could be one of the reasons why we've got these, getting these huge jumps in atmospheric CO2 concentration, which was unheard of, it's never happened before. Um, uh, it's very likely that our forests, uh, carbon sink are failing. Now we yeah. know, yeah. we know, and um, I know you're interested in runaway, a lot of people should be. Yeah. Um, uh, um, we, we know that the Arctic, the Arctic carbon sink has switched. The NOAA, their annual Arctic report card in 2016, they did a review of the sinks and the sources, and lo and behold, the Arctic's putting out more carbon than it's taking in now. And we know that the rainforests are switching. Yeah. Um, uh, so our problem is actually trying to get out to people just how bad things are. Mm -hmm. And there's been this uh, resistance in our in our strange, I, you know, I mean, we, we, you know, I was born in the me generation, right? Mm -hmm. And then we've had the affluent culture and then the consumer culture. So, you know, we've kind of been socially engineered by the corporations, I guess. Yeah. But um, uh, that's how we see ourselves and we've got to break out. And you're right, I'm right with you. 
it has to be done on an emotional, um, psychological, Virtual. heart basis. Ethic. Heart. You know, we, we need the heart as well as the head. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and also some uh, Extinction Rebellion tactics as well, I think. So, hey, so yeah, no, I, I, that's refreshing. That's very refreshing. Um, yeah. We are in the sixth extinction, as you know. The paper that was co-authored by Paul Ehrlich, um, uh, that was three years ago. They called it an annihilation, peer-reviewed paper. Yeah. yeah. We are in a, in a biological annihilation was the term of the paper. Yeah. And um, I think it was a Spanish scientist who was the lead author, as I recall. Um, and there was a paper in 2015 that said the rate of extinction is accelerating. And then we had just, what was it, a week ago, the United Nations IPBS, their big biodiversity um, e economy, you know, the, um, uh, what, what is called ecosystem services, right? Yeah. And they found that we're looking at one in eight species disappearing in the next three decades. It's every bit as bad as that guy, if not worse. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I, I mean, you know, Richard Leakey wrote the book, um, uh, The Sixth Extinction, and I think it was called The Future of Humanity or The Future of Civilization. That was a great book. I mean, I'm trying to remember when that was. Uh, I can't remember. But it was many years ago. And, um, uh, and so, uh, hopefully, hopefully, the public does understand now that we are in an unprecedented extinction of life on Earth. Well, well, they don't. They don't, Peter. And so, th so let me tell you about my, um, my proposed Extinction Rebellion campaign without going into too many of the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> okay. the, um, the uh, tactical details, which have shown okay. again. But we've identified a, um, a bit of a, um, a bottleneck where we can actually basically kettle in um, three of the major broadcasting companies in this city, very oh. easily, with a very small number of people, oh. and uh, basically give all of the journalists the day off, a bit like what the um, <laughs> BBC is getting at the moment because of Extinction Rebellion in London. They've all been yes, right. home because they can't get to work. So we got that in mind. And, yeah. um, and basically what we're going to do is we're going to say to the journalists, okay, you can't come to work now because we're not letting you, um, until we all get arrested, but that's fine because then that will be a really newsworthy story itself. Um, but here is the here is the executive summary of the biodiversity report you just referred to. Here yeah. is the here is the executive summary of the 1.5 C report. And yeah. if you could suggest another two or three, uh, is there a good report that we can give them an executive summary about ocean acidification? You know, so we're going to give them. Like oh, a yeah. oh my God! Yes, I mean there was a huge ocean report which um, uh, that came out in 2016. Um, I can send you the link. That was a huge report. Great, great. Okay. And, um, and if any, uh, any other reports that you think that the journalists ought to read while they're taking a couple of days off? I'll give them all to you. Don't worry. <laughs> um, uh, um, the evidence is overwhelming, okay? Yeah. yeah. The evidence is overwhelming that our economy... Uh, lack of belief, right? You know, as we, you and I have been discussing, um, is destroying. Yeah. Destroying all life. All life. All of life. Yeah. Omnicidal. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Now, fortunately, um, you and I came into the world when there was more life on the planet than ever before. Yes. Um, uh, and there's still a, a lot of life on the planet compared yeah. to the past. But the scientists, you know, the conservation biologists, they think that the sixth extinction is faster than any of the past extinctions. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. That's, you know, I mean, so we, we, we've got to understand we're doing crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. my, my reading is that the, uh, the Permian extinction, which is the one that I'm sort of most familiar with, took place over around about 20,000 years with those volcanic eruptions spreading all of the lava over the peat fields and the coal fields and the, the, the actual killing off took place over yeah. about 20,000 years. And if you yeah, look that was right on that. That, that, that's the most recent assessment, which is about a, 10 times faster than the previous estimates. So, right. right. And so, so if you then look at the permanent extinction versus in which, in which about 90 or 80 something percent of everything yeah. died. Yeah. What we're doing is about in, a, in around about 200 years. I mean, really, yeah. this started from the Industrial Revolution, yeah. um, say 300. That's 100 times faster. Yeah. That's profound. Yeah, and, and, and that, that, that 
twenty thousand. I, I, I'm, you know, I think that's a pretty solid number, actually. I, th I think it was a big surprise. It was sort of breaking new ground, but I, I think that's what those um, scientists who do that very interesting uh, science of way, 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 way back. Um, and, and, think also, and also, and also, ours is going to be deeper, I think, because I saw a, a photograph the other day of a celiacanth that had died, and it had a plastic bag in its stomach. Oh, gosh, so, yeah. so the celiacanth survived the extinction, the Permian extinction, but they're not going to survive ocean, ocean plastics. And also, if this thing happens really quickly, as Guy McPherson likes to point out about the nuclear power stations melting down and Fukushima yeah, yeah. 500, yeah. they're going to have because to deal with ionizing radiation as well. So, so what we've actually created is the perfect storm to not only rerun the Permian extinction 100 times faster, but to do it even deeper. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you know, um, I try and explain to people uh, at every opportunity that a problem is pollution. A scientific problem is pollution. We are polluting the entire planet. Mm. Every system in the planet is being polluted at an accelerated rate. And the word is interesting because, of course, the word has a religious connotation. Pollution right. comes from the Bible, I gather. Okay. I haven't found it, but people tell me it does, so that's good enough for me. Right. Um, uh, so this is this is a wrong thing to do. Yeah, you know, this is um, what human beings um, we're, we're doing what we really cannot do. Um, mm. You know. Yeah. And um, uh, we can we can we can change very very quickly. By the way, I think so too. I think so too. I've got a concept called <clears throat> ecophony, which is an ecological epiphany. And when I talk yeah. to a lot of people about who are environmentalists, they typically say that there was something that happened in their lives where they had like an awakening, or right. an emotional, right. spiritual, or intellectual awakening. Um, I was talking right. with um, Sam Mitchell the other day who runs a YouTube channel called Collapse Chronicles. His happened when he was 12 years old. And it was a, a Life magazine and an article about, it was called um, Taming the Green Hell. I went and found the, the, the cover for him. Um, the other, yeah. well, I helped him find the cover the other day. So it was, it was, about, it was about putting a road through the Amazon. And at 12 oh. years old, he realized that we had this unsustainable system and he's been with him for his whole life. So I'm, I'm working on diff with a few different people trying to find ideas where we can basically foster people to have that emotion, that ecological awakening. Um, yeah. And in so yeah. doing, grow the army of people that are actually trying to make it better. Because I'm, I'm always, you know, no matter how bad it gets, we can all, always stop making it worse by making it better. So there's yeah. some opportunity yeah. there. But hey, Guy, did, did you know of Polly Higgins? The, I, met, the, I met Polly Higgins once, yeah. She's lovely. And she you died. heard that she died recently. Yeah, yeah. I, I met her um, last year. We were on a panel at, um, at The Hague, the International Criminal Court. And right, we, yes. were, we were explaining that um, what we were doing um, has to be, you know, uh, Crime. Uh, terrible, terrible crime, and um, we should um, we should have this acknowledged, you know. Mm. So um, she had one of those epiphanies, guy. She right. told me that she just won a barrister in England. I, I'm I, I just can't believe that she's gone. She's such a wonderful person. Yeah, and so quickly. But she said she had a briefcase. She just won this big case, and she said halfway down the steps, I said to myself, I'm not going to do this anymore. Yeah, I'm going to work for planet earth right i heard her tell the same story and the way i heard yeah. it was that she, the same same what you just said but she looked out a window and saw the the, the forest and the trees or the town and yeah. she said i'm i'm representing a human being who is representing nature aha uh -huh. that's how i heard well, it um uh, she's a ter terrible loss but yeah. um in those years that um uh, you know she did a lot. She did a wonderful, wonderful job, and she influenced so many people. Yeah, you know, um, yeah. Particularly in her profession, all around the world. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, look. There's. Um. Uh, look. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm gonna call the. I'm gonna call the interview to a, a hold here. We're actually uh, on time. Um, okay. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. It was great to thank meet you. It's been a great pleasure, and um, uh, I really appreciate you giving me a chance to. Um, uh, let people know what the data is and how terrible the situation is. That's great. Okay. And we'll, we'll get you back on in the future and we'll, and we'll have some more graphs and we'll um, do more of the same again. All right.
yeah, I'd like to hear about your, your ideas and plans. Okay, great. Talk soon. Bye-bye. Okay, thanks, guys.